And there we go. You're on. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome. Um, my name is Maximilian. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, I'm one of the Attix guys, basically. Uh, and we're going to present a, a bit of a uh, user story from developing and packaging pulp to using pulp. Um, and today I'm not alone. I'm with uh, Quirin and Gauss. And for a yeah short introduction, I'm just going to hand over to Quirin to introduce himself. Yeah, so I'm just going to say you probably know me most as a pulp dev maintainer and pulp dev developer. Um, but today we're talking about how we use pulp and pulp installation internally. So we've we've graduated from developing pulp to using pulp. Um, and I'm not sure that's the right order of doing things, but that's what we hope to talk about today. And Gauss, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks. So my name is uh, Gauss. It's my nickname. Um, you can find me on GitHub and all discourse channels and stuff like that under my nickname, Gorsner. I started working at Attix uh, in March this year. And before that, I never heard anything about Pulp. And now I'm working with Pulp. I'm developing Pulp for Pulp. And I enjoy it. Maximilian. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Uh, then let's uh, jump right in. So uh, I'm going to basically start with an introduction. Why are we here? So basically answer the question, why are we packaging pulp? Uh, and then in the second part, I'm going to hand over to Quirin. He's going to give a demo of how our um, yeah build system basically works. Um, and then in the third part, uh, we're going to hand over to Gauss to talk a little bit about our experiences and what's basically uh, yeah, yet to come for us. Um, yeah, so why are we packaging pulp? So short answer, because we have to. Um, so we work at Attic, uh, creating and providing a commercial downstream product based on Foreman and Catello. Um, and as you all might know, uh, Catello itself relies on pulp to manage content. And so far from our uh, user experience and developer experience, we mostly focused on pulp basically inside Catello. Um, and for that, as you all know, developing, developing is only half the battle. You also need to package it. Um, and developing for us means basically um, either cherry picking uh, bug fixes and backporting them or backporting features um, or adding our own um, changes, basically. Um, and once yeah, once development is basically um, done, we also obviously have to package it. Um, yeah, and now I'm going to give a short introduction uh, on our workflow. So how are we developing Pulp? Um, I think for upstream, we're just going to do what everybody else does. We work on the nightly versions. Um, and yeah, are, as uh, Quirin and Gauss mentioned, uh, part of the community and uh, work on upstream, et cetera, et cetera. But in downstream for us, we have um, branches that we base on upstream releases. So for example, if there is a pulp core 3.15.2 release tag, then we create internal branches with an ATX prefix um, that we um, consider stable branches which basically means we all have to own our mistakes if something happens. Uh, we will not rewrite history. We will only yeah, add stuff, add internal changes, um, add uh, cherry picks, et cetera, et cetera. And our um, typical workflow is based on feature branches. So um, making a change means creating a um, feature branch that you, for example, uh, put a cherry pick on uh, and then create a merge request, um, which we can then review. We can then um, deploy that change um, and basically merge it. Um, and using our uh, GitLab pipeline to um, package pulp uh, allows us to create a theoretically shippable and more importantly, testable RPM package with every commit that we push to GitLab. And yeah, this was the developing part. Now let's jump over to the packaging part. 
So how are we packaging pulp? Um, and it basically consists of two parts. So we have the spec files that we take from pulp core packaging. Again, as mentioned with our, um, yeah, basically own stable branch based, of an up, based on an upstream release. Um, and we combine that with um, downstream repositories, for example, for uh, pulp RPM or pulp DEP um, that uh, basically provide the um, code that will be used as the source uh, in the spec file. Um, our whole workflow uh, is based on GitLab pipelines. And we use a container, so container-based workflow, uh, meaning we have um, different container images, uh, A, based on the job type. So for example, if we want to um, package a yeah, Python uh, source um, um, RPM package, or we want to um, yeah, package uh, Ruby source, et cetera, et cetera, I think uh, querying will uh, show in his demo uh, the yeah, most prevalent example in the um, pulp core packaging um, for us. And then the, the second factor is the enterprise Linux version. So we have these container images um, for uh, yeah, both EL7 and EL8. Um, yeah, and so before we basically had a Jenkins pipeline, uh, and because I'm on the record, I'm going to say it's historically grown. Um, so I think it has a lot of interesting features. Uh, but internally, we as a team basically decided um, that we want to um, yeah, phase out Jenkins. And the Jenkins pipeline was due to an overhaul. Um, and because we already use and like GitLab and GitLab um, pipelines, uh, we decided to add a pulp instance. Our pulp instance is called warehouse um, to yeah package package pulp basically um, and yeah as in the third bullet point uh, the GitLab pipeline then um, if it builds something uh, pushes the package uh, the build package to our um, warehouse um, yeah so what's the what's the benefit of doing this um, so I think the the most important part is the overall improved experience so it's it's much faster and easier to understand what you want to build package and where you want to store it it's much easier to consume content from um yeah basically um pulp or basically repositories in our pulp warehouse um and for us it was just a natural extension so we already rely on linting and testing a lot uh, in our gitlab uh, in our um, yeah, GitLab, using GitLab CI. Um, so the, the natural uh, next step was basically to um, add packaging to this and basically take it away from Jenkins. Um, so the packaging part is much more tightly integrated with our um, actual code. Um, and the second part is, yeah, we, we are now able to simultaneously package, as, as I mentioned before, for EL7 and EL8. Um, and we basically do not have to repackage a Nefra. So a um, Nefra stands for name, epoch, version, release, and architecture, and basically makes a RPM package uniquely identifiable. Um, yeah, and I think uh, Quirin will, in the second part, uh, elaborate on the mechanism and how we ensure that we don't have to repackage a Nefra um, again. Um, yeah, and then on the last slide before I'm going to hand over to uh, Quirin. So, quick, um, yeah, I think summary of why we like using Pulp or why we decided to use Pulp for this. Um, so, yeah, you know, Pulp is a dedicated content management system. Um, before we had uh, Jenkins as a build server, and we have had a plain um, HTTP that was um, yeah, basically storing repositories. Um, and for that, we used in the past um, self yeah, or homemade uh, shell scripts to create repository metadata. Um, and we did this both for um, repositories that we synchronized from somewhere else. So for example, from upstream. Um, and we also did this for, I would characterize as 
bundles of packages. So imagine you have a Jenkins pipeline that um, builds, let's say, 30 packages, and then you store them in one directory, and then you go to this directory and basically run create repo to create the metadata. But actually, to have consumable content, it's much, much easier um, just doing this in pulp. Um, this results in way, way less bandwidth required between our build server, that would be our GitLab runners, and the artifact store, that would be our pulp warehouse. Um, and it also means we actually save a lot of disk space due to the um, yeah, deduplication efforts um, done in pulp. Um, yeah, and the, the, the summary is basically, that was our, our goal from the get-go um, to have a better developer experience. And I think we achieved this with mostly um, yeah, faster, faster pipelines um, to test um, changes quicker and to integrate them um, yeah, faster. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Quirin. Yeah. So I'm just going to try and grab the screen share. Uh, yeah. My entire screen. Uh, entire screen allow. Did that work? Ah, looks like it's doing something. OK, and then we're going to head over to the slides. Um, so yeah, same as before. I can no longer see you guys. Um, so thank you, Maximilian. And I really now want to show you guys a demo of how it works. But for that demo to be meaningful, I need to get into the weeds a bit of our RPM versioning schema. And for that to be meaningful, I need to go over the design goals we were trying to achieve with that schema. So here they are. Um, the first one, don't package the same commit twice. So that's basically our biggest pain point with our existing build system, where we basically use the Jenkins pipeline number as part of the version. And then means every time the pipeline runs, it rebuilds all the packages, whether there is actually new source on the branch we're trying to package or not which means if I like want to add one line of code to pulp depth, let's say, for example, um, I then spend the next 30 minutes watching uh, Foreman and Cadello rebuild before I get my pulp package, which, yeah, is painful. And we really didn't want to repeat that. The second one is no duplicate nevras. So that's really just a hard and fast rule of RPM packaging. Uh, you don't want your build pipeline to build multiple packages with the exact same nevra but different content. If that ever escapes into your production repositories, you're going to be in a world of pain because you have no idea what Yuma is actually installing. Um, then the next one is a bit of a no-brainer. Newer code states must have a higher RPM version. Well, yes, if we do yum update, we want it to install our newest package and not some random package. Um, but that means RPM versions don't just need to change from one build to the next. They need to sort of grow in the right way. Um, then the fourth one is we want to minimize manual spec file changes. Now, I have nothing but respect for like the previous talk and the RPM packaging team doing pulp core packaging. But um, as a developer, I want to spend most of my time working on features and bug fixes and not a lot of time uh, checking uh, changes to spec files into source and pushing them to source. So like philosophically, for me, um, my source version control is Git. And I have a tag in Git. And that gives me the version. and then. Once I push that tag, I don't also want to have to write that same version into a spec file if I can help it. And basically, because the upstream packaging team does all of that work maintaining those spec files, we can just sort of grab them, reuse them, and don't have to do all of that work. So kudos to you. Um, then final point, meaningful versions that tell us what the RPM contains. So once we have a built RPM package 
and it's installed on some system, maybe a customer system, a test system, a internal production system, whatever it is, I want to see immediately from the version, from the RPM version, what that particular package actually contains in terms of my source code. So that when you know test comes back to me and tells me, yes, I installed this RPM package and now everything is broken, I actually know what they installed. Um, yeah. um, OK, moving on. So now that I have built, I need to go page down. Um, so now that I have talked about these design goals, I can talk about the versioning scheme. And so for our example in our uh, demo that I'll get to in just a moment, um, we're going to use pulpdep as our example. So we have the git source repo of pulpdep, and we have the 2.16.2 tag in the git repository. And we basically want to package a version based on that upstream release. And what pulpcore packaging does is they will take that version and with the pulpcore packaging repo that you got to know in the previous talk, they will build this sort of RPM package from it. And I'm just going to split that up into its Nevra components. So the name is Python 3.8 pulp depth. Uh, the epoch is the empty string in this case. It doesn't have an epoch, which implies a epoch of 0. That's just how RPM packaging works or RPM versioning works. The version is 2.16.2, so that's just the upstream, the tag in, in the Git repository, and that's the version of the software. And then they have this revision version, which is basically controlled by the RPM packager, in this case, by pulpcore packaging. And so their revision here is 1.el8. And uh, they might sometimes bump that 1 to 2 or 3 or even something like 2.1.el8. Yeah. And the architecture is no arch. So, for our downstream packaging, we basically leave all of that as is in the upstream spec file. And the only thing we're going to change is the release version, so the R from the Nevra. And so I'm now going to talk just about the release version. And the upstream spec file that we use has in it the release version 1% dist. So basically, they use a variable there, which is very convenient for us. Uh, and that basically turns into the package version we saw on the previous slide with 1.el8. So clearly, in their upstream build, this dist variable resolves to .el8. And for our downstream build, we're just going to have this dist set this dist variable to something else, to whatever we like. And in the example that we're going to get to, it's going to be .2.0.atix.el8. And so we get a final ATIX release or downstream release string of 1.2.0.atix.el8. And the 1 just corresponds to the same thing that's in the upstream spec file and then the upstream release. So that could eventually come, become .2 or .2.1, uh, whatever's in the upstream release file. We just set the dist. And then the .2 part, that's our internal commit count. So that is the number of commits that live on the branch we're packaging on top of the upstream 2.16.2 tag. Um, and because we basically have a commit count, and we usually use for our uh, production repos a um, protected branch, that commit count is always just going to grow. And it's always going to uniquely identify a specific commit on that branch on top of the uh, tag, which means the commit count already lets us uniquely identify what was packaged into this particular RPM version. And so the way our build pipeline then works is it will say, OK, I'm supposed to package this branch. It has two commits on it. I'm now going to ask the pulp instance. So from that, I can build this version. And now I'm going to ask the pulp instance, do you already have a uh, built RPM for exactly this version? If you do, uh, 
then I'm just going to take the pulp href for that and add it to the repository. That's my target repository, and be happy. And if you don't, then I'm actually going to package the package myself and upload it to pulp and add it to the repository that way. OK. So that was the commit count. And then behind the commit count, we have this 0, which is our Atix release. Um, so like I just said, if we don't change anything in our source repository, then our um, build pipeline will just flat out refuse to repackage that package, because it says, I've already packaged this. And for the situations where we do want to force a rebuild, even though we didn't change anything in the source repository that goes with it, um, we have this Atix release, and we can just bump it from 0 to 1, and that way we get a new version, and that way the package will be rebuilt. Um, so yeah, and then behind that release, we just have .atix, which lets us easily identify the packages we've packaged ourselves and where we're not using the upstream packages. And then we add the EL8, which is just the same thing upstream also adds to their release. So having now that we all have our head buzzing with version numbers, <laughs> I will finally get to that demo I promised. And to do that, I will head over to our uh, pipeline repository. So this is the repository that basically includes the GitLab CI.yaml that defines our pipeline. And as you can see in this pipeline repository here in Kitka, I have created a pulpcon demo branch. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to push that branch. Uh, Pulpcon demo. Um, and by pushing that branch, uh, I will have triggered a pipeline run for that branch on our GitLab instance. And as you can see here in the Git car, I actually pushed this branch exactly in the same place as our three, six, existing 316 branch. That's for the that's our um, production branch for packaging Pulp Core 316 and its plugins. Um, so basically, because I'm in the exact same place, I haven't changed anything relative to our production branch. We shouldn't be rebuilding any packages in this pipeline, uh, because all of the packages have already been built for the 316 branch. And so I'm going to go and head over to GitLab. And I'm just going to create a merge request for this branch. That's just so we can easily see all the pipelines that go with this branch. Uh -huh. So we don't have any changes, because I pushed it exactly at the 316 branch. Uh, but we do have a pipeline. And as we can see, the whole pipeline, which currently doesn't package that many packages. You can see here, these are all the packages where we have changes relative to the upstream release. So that's pulp gleadep, pulp dep, pulp rpm, pulp core, and Python Debian. And the whole pipeline took 53 seconds to run. And it's done some linting. It created a pulp repository on our pulp instance. It ran all these packaging jobs. And we're just going to run look at one of these in more details. And here it ran a check existing function to talk to Pulp. Do you already have this Nevra I'm trying to package here? And then Pulp answered back, yes, I do. So we get project Pulp Dep has already been packaged for requested ever nothing to package. Um, and that's why this pipeline went so relatively fast. And then we have a publish job. And this publish job will help will fully give us a URL to where it published these packages we've just built. Um, and we can see what packages this repository contains. And so all of these packages are packages that were just already in our pulp instance and were added to this repository via the pulp href um, because we didn't actually build anything. And what I'm going to go and do now is introduce some actual code changes, or at least simulate that. So I'm going to head over to my pulpdep repository. And here I also have a pulpcon demo branch. 
and it lives on top of the 2.16.2 upstream release tag. And I've added two commits to this branch relative to the tag. So what we're imagining right now is a situation where maybe 2.16.3 hasn't actually been released yet. Uh, and we just have on the 2.16 branch some bug fixes, and we want to release them right now and not wait for the 2.16.3 upstream release. So I've cherry-picked here this sanitize artifact pass before downloading from this branch, and another one handle duplicate default distribution publications. So these are my two bug fixes that I want to release right now. And then I go over to my packaging repository. And I just open my build constants. And I tell it for pulp dep, you're going to use my issue branch, which is pulp con demo. Um, and I am going to have to push that, or commit. Uh, Use issue branch for pulp dep. And I'm going to push that. And now, if I head over back to GitLab and back to our merge request, there's going to be a second pipeline run popping up because we pushed a new commit. And we can already see it starting running. And Hopefully, one of the things we can see is that the pulp dev run will now take longer than before and also longer than the other packages. Because for the other packages, nothing has changed as before. But for pulp dev, well, you need to wait a little bit for the runner to actually get there. We're now going to have to actually package that new RPM package with the two new commits. Um, so if I refresh here, I see everything but pulp dep has finished because it didn't actually have to package anything. And maybe I can start seeing some output on pulp dep. Our runners are a little slow today. Ah, there. Now the whole job has finished. And we can already see the output is different from before. We have some uh, check existing was called, but it did not report back that this Nevra that we're packaging for already exists in pod. Therefore, we then called package. And package basically uses RPM build tools to run uh, install build dep and uh, to turn this into an RPM package. And then we have other jobs in the pipeline or we, which will upload that package that we've just built to pulp. And then finally, we have the published job, which has already run, which means we should now be able to see our new package here. And yes, we do. And so we now have an additional pulp dep package here that we just built. Um, and one of the things you can see is that it actually has a smaller version than the pulp dep package we already had. That's because I built my example branch exactly on top of the upstream tag and not on top of our um, production branch. So normally, we have a ATX2.16.2 branch, and that's what's packaged from our production branch. Uh, and that would now right now contains a commit count of 14. So there we have 14 commits relative to the upstream tag. And if I then build my issue branch on top of that branch, I would get a commit count of 1.16.0. And in order to not get these uh, issue branch builds mixed up with our production builds, we have this tilde testing added just for issue branch builds. Because on issue branches, I can rebase, which means there I don't have the same kind of guarantees that my commit count will only ever grow. and that the same never will really only contain new code states. So having gone through all of that, I'm going to now head back to those design goals we had and go through them one more time. 
So we want meaningful versions that tell us what the RPM contains. Well, we have that because the RPM version contains a commit count. And if I know what branch we are packaging, then I know exactly what commit was packaged in that particular RPM package. Uh, minimize manual spec file changes. We don't have to do any spec file changes uh, because we just set that dist variable that exists within the spec file. We only have to choose a new spec file if we really upgrade, if we do a major version upgrade, um, or if we want a newer upstream spec file. Uh, then newer code states must have a higher RPM version. So this is not true on issue branches, because on issue branches, I, as the developer, can rebase. Um, but we keep a wall of sep separation between our issue branch builds and our main branch builds. And the main branch builds are protected branches, so the commit count only ever grows. So I automatically get a higher RPM version. No duplicate nevers. Again, only strictly true for the uh, production branches and not for the issue branch builds, although we may add pipeline numbers just for the issue branch builds. Then we would really have globally unique nevras for anything we ever package uh, in our pub instance. And also, like this isn't really an issue, because whenever we merge the issue branch, then the package gets built for the um, for the um, production branch uh, with a unique nevra. And then once we merge that branch, the, the issue branch, the issue branch gets deleted. And we have this cleanup job, which will be triggered. And that cleanup job will remove this issue branch repository from pulpdep. And at that point, all the issue branch builds become orphans to disappear with the next pulp orphan cleanup. And um, finally, don't package the same commit twice. Well, we have that very right off the bat because we have this commit count. And unless I actually push a new commit, nothing new will be packaged. Um, and that's basically the whole magic. So the whole magic is that we can query pulp for do you already have this nevra that I want to build? And once we know the answer, we can decide whether we need to, where the, whether this pipeline run needs to package this particular code state. Okay, so I am going to stop sharing my screen. And in a moment. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for sharing all that. Um, it's pretty great uh, hearing you talk about um, how you've been able to integrate pulp into your you know CI CD infrastructure. I mean the if you will, the bottom line is that I can push a code change and if I especially if I merge that into one of our main branch and within two minutes there will be a repository that has a new package with that code change in it. And some test system from QI could run a yum update in that moment and have that new package for testing. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, OK. And so I think any further questions we can have after the talk, because there's still Gorse's time on all of our experiences of actually installing our own pulp instance and getting this up and running. And yeah. So over to you. Yeah, Kvirin, thank you for the demo. So next, we want to tell you a little bit about the experiences we have made with our Pulp Warehouse. So first of all, we can say we have a simple but versatile infrastructure for our packaging pipeline. So we only need a GitLab server, the GitLab runners. We don't need any architecture or S-dependent servers, as we all uh, always use Docker containers. And the third part is the Pulp instance. And that's all we need to package and deploy our stuff. So it's easy to maintain and very inexpensive. Secondly, our paths on our pulp warehouse are pretty easy to understand. They're basically, uh, basically structured according to the project, the branch, the EL version, and the architecture, as has been, or you were able to see this in the demo. 
let's say so. Um, this also means that we have one repository on our warehouse for one branch in ORPAL packaging. And I think that's pretty cool as testing newer package versions, such as bug fixes or stuff like that, is as simple as just adding the repository to a package manager. And then you usually you get a higher package version you can just install with Yum because usually your issue branch is dependent on uh, on the production branch or uh, based on the production branch. And so you get a higher nephra for your issue branch and you just can simply update your packages and test your bug fixes. Then the next experience, um, as we have the branch represented in the repository URL, we actually don't use the branch name for that. Uh, but instead, we use the commit ref slug, which is basically the lowercase branch name shortened to uh, to 63 characters. And uh, everything despite letters and numbers is replaced by a dash. Um, and that's the recommended uh, way for using branch name in uh, branch names in URLs according to the GitLab documentation. Um, so you won't get problems with the URL having slashes and stuff like that. And last but not least, we uh, started just pushing files to our pulp instance in a single post. But we pretty soon had to switch to the chunked upload RP um, because we got errors uploading larger packages. So basically, chunked upload means now we upload file chunks via post requests, followed by a commit post request where up on the final artifact for the file gets assembled um, instead of the single post request we had previously. Next, some small points about our installation process. Uh, we used the, the uh, we installed pulp using the, the Ansible installer, pulp installer. Therefore, we wrote simply a playbook that configures everything needed. And this playbook is simply stored in a Git repository. We can say the installation process using the Ansible installer is pretty straightforward. It's very flexible. You can configure the plugins that should be installed. You can choose from a variety, a variety of roles, um, the web server, the database that should be installed, or just install all roles or all services. And you have many more configuration options for the Pulp in, uh, Ansible installer. Um, and the only hurdle we really noticed during the installation process is that the documentation is spread out. For example, on the one hand, you have the document, <coughs> sorry, the documentation of Pulp itself. And on the other hand, there's the documentation of the Pulp installer. And so you have to pick a little bit for the information you need at different points, but in the end, it's straightforward work together. Another good thing about the Ansible installer is that you can configure custom certificates uh, to use for the web server. So by default, the Ansible installer will create self-signed certificates up on installation. And uh, everybody knows the error messages, the browser messages, hey, your connection is not secure. But you can simply specify certificate paths via variables to the Ansible installer so that those certificates will be used upon installation for the web server. But during the installation process, we also came across some stumbling blocks. Um, first of all, we tried to install Pulp on Rocky Linux 8. And during that, we came across some weird errors. And finally, we found out that Rocky Linux wasn't officially supported by the Ansible installer. But upon request, it was pretty quickly added to the Ansible installer. Thanks for that. And so we could continue with our installation. Also, we had some trouble with the Ansible FQDN. We used this um, in the um, playbook as the content origin for the pulp installer, which is basically the base URL for the pulp instance. And um, on the first try, the Ansible FQDN was simply set to the host name. So we got weird URLs without domain name. And finally, we found out that the host name has to be set in etc host name, and the host name and FQDN have to be set correctly in etc hosts for the Ansible FQDN to work. And finally, pulp returned 
super nice URLs. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the last stumbling block, um, we had some problems with our HTTP proxy, but this was simply a configuration problem, um, and we, we had a little bit to investigate it. But Pulp redirects all traffic arriving at port 80 to port 443. And our proxy simply tried to send all traffic encrypted or not to port 80. So we ended up in a nice request loop. And once we found out that, it was working. Now, how do we, uh, now, uh, now we want to tell you a little bit um, about how we talk to the to the to pulp uh, via the pulp rp we talk to our pulp instance using plain rest rp requests and therefore we wrote our own little class um, providing basic methods and i want to show that uh, class to you now so just switch the window so this is our simple short class can we it... can't see any code yet we're still on the presentation ah, okay, to okay. API. And, okay one moment because i selected a uh, entire screen but seems it's only sharing the presentation ah <laughs> my mistake now you're seeing a window. There we go. Uh, yeah. If okay. You can yeah. Make it a little bit bigger. I, I had a look at this, but not in this editor. I think. View only the color scheme. Color scheme. Try control not plus. Nope. Control shift plus. <laughs> nope. Well, then I'm out of ideas. OK, control, I only can... control or control middle mouse. Nope. Here. Nope. Oh, well. So don't use uh, XFC mouse pad. <laughs> 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 but OK, I hope you can see a little bit of the code, but the code doesn't really matter. I just wanted to show you we have basic methods, delete, get, post, and Put that simply start requests to the pulp RP. And we have one method to pull the state of pulp tasks. So we can trigger a task and then wait for the, the result. You, For example, you need this for the chunked upload RP because the commit uh, post request uh, creates a task and returns that. And once this task is completed, you get the final artifact. And we have one little bit larger it's not really large more code lines uh, for creating or updating distributions and that's it that's all our communication stuff with the pulp rp and with our pulp instance we need so but why didn't we use all the available alternatives so there are pulp cli pulp squeezer and the pulp client bindings but when we started with the project we did not have much experience with pulp cli and pulp squeezer and both projects were pretty early stage so we decided not to take that and pulp client bindings okay um, they are auto generated an interface for the rp for talking okay but maybe an rp changes these require uh, exact version matching. If you remove methods, if you rename endpoints, stuff like that. So we didn't use those. We simply wrote our own class. We are more flexible that way. Now, how do we want to continue with pulp, with our pulp usage? So on one hand, we want to package Foreman and Catello based on Foreman packaging. We um, Up to now, we, we only package pulp packages. Those are all Python packages. But our pipeline is flexible, modular. And we also are capable of packaging Ruby stuff and different packaging types. So now, the next step, Foreman and Catello. 
And in future, we also want to add file repositories to hold ISO images to our pulp instance and app repositories to provide packages for Debian and Ubuntu. Yeah, and last, we also want some time to synchronize upstream repositories into pulp. All in all, we can say GitLab CI and pulp for artifact storage is a very powerful combination for our packaging pipeline. It's very efficient. It's pretty fast if you package just the changes. It's storage efficient. It's, um, it's great. So finally, we can say we package pulp because we have to, but now we use pulp because we like it. And therefore, we want to thank everyone in the pulp community for their work. Any questions? Yeah, <clears throat> what version of Pulp Core are you running right now? That's a good question. I think I would have to check our Ansible playbook that installs it. <laughs> On my way, give me a sec. But yes, this is like, in the long run, so we have this playbook that basically defines our pulp instance. So we can quite easily reinstall pulp if it ever gets borked or something, and then just rerun our pipelines to repopulate it. But so far, we haven't yet done any regular upgrades. So that's something we'll have to learn to do as time goes by. Um, I had a look at the moment we use. Uh, pulp 3.20.3. And it's pretty recent. Scusi? I said it's pretty recent. Yeah, we we started uh, setting up the warehouse some months ago. So yeah, we took the most recent version and we installed plugins, pulp dep, pulp file, and pulp RPM up to now. Also, cool. before before we had that uh, 3.20 pulp core instance, we used um like very basic installation on one of our like internal test systems that we have on our development infrastructure and so we had that for a while before we have had this current one uh, and that one used self-signed certificates and was just yeah i think it was very much a test system to get started and then eventually we switched over to a yeah a bit more robust installation cool um, how would you feel about upgrading to a container-based installation? If you could just do it in place, just uh, using the same database that you have now and the same file system. Oh, I actually, yeah, what kind of storage are you using? Are you using it's the local file system? Just the local file system, right? It's a yeah. small installation, right? We have a small development team pushing packages to this. We don't have millions of requests a day uh, so but i don't know conceivably it might have to grow as we use it more and more intensely so we'll kind of have to see i think we also don't yet have an orphan cleanup job that will definitely eventually <laughs> become necessary um, so yeah i guess it's the pipeline is quite small as it is right now. We only package a couple of pulp packages. We've now started packaging Foreman and Catello packages as well, which is more complicated because they have more complicated sort of some things need to be built against things we've just built in the same pipeline run. Um, Let me ask you a different the, question. Yeah. Um, do you, what, in general, in your company, do you guys run applications as containers or do you tend to install things the way you install Pulp? So our GitLab, I think, is not in a container. Our Pulp warehouse is now not in a container. So most things are sort of essentially bare metal installs or maybe they're installs on VMware VMs. Um, 
So of I course, like for example, so all our GitLab runners have uh, Docker installed on them, and all the GitLab CI jobs run in a container on those GitLab runners. Uh, yeah. So our our um, GitLab CI workflow is container based, mm -hmm. as I've mentioned before. But the warehouse is a virtual machine, and I think there would be a we would need a really, 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 really good reason to touch that and move it to basically a yeah container based um, system. And we don't really have a reason right now, I think, to do to do that. But I mean, conceivably, so, one could like install Docker on that virtual machine and then run Pulp on top of that or Popman or whatever. Um, yeah, I would recommend I guess Pulp. One there, there would be there would have to be some kind of need, I guess. So if one, it becomes point, small for our purposes, then we decide what what do we do about it. One point about our warehouse is that um, we don't have a backup strategy for that. We discussed uh, do we need a backup strategy, and we discovered oh okay, so we have one Ansible playbook to install the warehouse, and then we have to trigger three or four GitLab pipelines, and they make take some time to run but then we have all packages again also so yeah we have so we have all our that's basically our development infrastructure so we have our development state repositories on this pub instance and then when we do really customer release those repositories get synced to a different system anyway so that system has a backup strategy and so if we completely kill our pub instance we probably yeah, need to spend a day to rebuild it in the and where, where we're not going to do a lot of developing, but then uh, we probably have refilled it with our current builds. Yeah, I've, I've just checked on the warehouse itself, so it's it's pretty small, I would say. I have a question kind of related to Dennis's, I guess, which is, um, you know, what uh, what aspects of this can be shared so that another user in the pulp community who basically wants what you've already got can have a lower level of effort to accomplish yeah. it. Now it won't be the same because there's a lot of stuff here that's specific to your to your interest in your business. Um, there's a lot so, that's not like the GitLab stuff, for instance. So um, basically, I mean our pipeline code obviously does have a lot of pretty specific assumptions about using pulp core packaging spec files and uh, yeah and packaging pulp packages and so on but there is sort of a architecture to it that easily allows you to add, add. so we have this base packager class and then we have a bunch of different packager classes that inherit from it um, so that's how we so we have one for packaging pypy packages uh, using a pulp core packaging spec file and one class for packaging Ruby gems or whatever. Um, and so all of that CI code is contained in its own little Python module. And then what happens, maybe actually I grab the screen share one more time and just show it. Uh, can I do yeah. that? So, let me see, entire screen, allow. Am I sharing yet? There we go. Yep. Um, so if I go back to our packaging repository here, or pub packaging, this is the one that defines the package, uh, the pipeline for packaging pulp. And it's very minimal. It actually only contains this Aura CI resources as a submodule, which is the thing that contains all our Python code for running the actual pipeline. And then it has a GitLab CI.yaml and it has a build constants.yaml. And basically the, the GitLab CI.yaml defines all of the jobs, obviously, no way of yeah, reducing that. And it always use all the jobs use the same script. They basically run from or CI resources import CI job entry point, and then they give it the CI job name. And then this CI job entry point, which is uh, in the or CI resources. Uh, uh, 
jo uh, CI job entry point I need. Um, that will basically read the build constants, initialize a build constants class with that, uh, and then use the job name to decide which particular job class it needs to call. And so at the end, it basically all the CI, all the all the GitLab jobs use the same script, and then via the job name that they provide, we choose a specific job class to. So if we have our pipeline run totally different runs depending on whether we're packaging a package or whether preparing a pulp repo or running a published job or a cleanup job, and so this. Uh, if you will, this Python module is actually, well, it has some assumptions specific to our thing, but it is kept in a pretty sort of generic way. Uh, and then so I can basically ch switch over to our work in progress uh, or Foreman packaging pipeline, uh, which then also has a GitLab CI.yaml and also has a build constants. And the real difference is here we have gem source repos, where in the other pipeline we have uh, PyPy packages or Py source packages. So we have sort of different types of packaging jobs that are defined by these various lists. And then they each get a set of variables. And then just based on those variables, the job will do slightly different things depending on what kind of package we're trying to package here. So in that sense, it's quite extensible. And one could maybe use that or a CI resources module for other things. But it would probably be some more work to like, um, yeah, get some of the very uh, specific assumptions out of it and get it more generalized still. Cool. Yeah, thanks for showing that. That's helpful. Um, it would be, I can see a, a more general need for doing that. On the one hand, it's kind of, you know, like it's not a lot, like complexity wise, it's it's not. Um, and it's also pretty specific to your stuff. So, you know, generalizing that, you know, like, is it worth it? I don't know, but I kind of think it might be worth it. Not even necessarily for you to do it because you've met your own needs. So I don't want to ask you to maybe additionally invest time when you already have your stuff solved. but. That would be, this would be helpful for the pulp community. So maybe even just, I don't know if it's publicly available, but even it's that. right now, but <laughs> yeah. So but that, we could talk so, about that, yeah. Yeah, if we could talk about that at some point, that would be, I think that would be good. Because at least then other people could handle the work of generalizing it. It's, I think it's really, really useful what you've built and very, very cool. Um, what you built. So going back to Dennis's question just for one second. So it, I think it's a little bit related. Um, on the one hand, for you know, his question was like, how would you feel about running a container environment? And rightfully so, I hear uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, like it already works, right? So like I get that. Um, but then now if some other person wants to go and do this, the economics of it are changed. You know, they're a brand new installation and what would be better for them? I, I heard that you had some trouble, for instance, with your choice of using Rocky Linux. And this comes back to the installer having to get deeply involved in every operating system in order to support it. And this is one area where the container path for the project really, really shines. So like I um, I take Dennis's question differently, which is to say like, if we wound back the clock and you didn't already have this stuff, would, would have running a container-based option have been, would you have been comfortable with that option? So I don't really think so. So I think that the smart move would have been to ask our internal IT to uh, give maybe uh, more support in providing or in provisioning the pop instance, because it actually it was a yeah a, a learning experience as Gauss, um said, and we do have container based application like running container uh, containers knowledge uh, for that. Uh, internally, but in our engineering team, I think we were just comfortable doing it um, the way we did it. Yeah, I mean, cool. what could have yeah, I built a playbook that you know pulls a pulp container image and runs that to run pulp? Uh, 
but yeah, I guess we don't immediately have a need for it. And like our use case is really, really small. We, we're not yet concerned with scaling this installation or any of that. <clears throat> but what about, we'll see how it goes. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, at some point you're gonna be upgrading and I think that might be a consideration. Yeah, that might be like if we decide. So that would be a you know plausible thing for how this might continue to develop. So we start you know needing to upgrade our pub instances instance regularly. Then we need to do it on the test system first, so we don't break everything. Uh, then that becomes a quite complex and time-consuming workflow. And then maybe we decide actually it'd be easier to have a pipeline that deploys a container. Could happen. But yeah, we're yeah. not there yet. <laughs> cool. Thank you for sharing your perspective on this. And thank you for sharing this excellent work. You're welcome. Yeah. So for our purpose, it was quite nifty. <laughs> yeah, this was awesome. Like it's great to see pulp in action. <laughs> And there's a lot of pulp involved in that particular action. <laughs> it's all pulp all the way down. <laughs> all right, I think we can stop the recording at this point.